It's uh, April 3rd and the start of the national tour to stop the deployment in South Korea, which will feature Reverend Song Hae Kim, who is co-chair of the Songju Civil <coughs> Committee to stop that deployment in South Korea. She'll speak in 10 cities over the next two weeks. The tour is sponsored by the task force to stop that in Korea and militarism in Asia and the Pacific. And Paul Lim of the Korea Policy Institute, a member organization of the task force. I'm here this morning with Theodore Postal, who has agreed to provide the national tour audiences uh, with a background on the pros and cons of the FAD system. He is Professor of Science, Technology, and International Security at MIT, and an expert in missile defense systems. Uh, thanks for being with us, Ted. It's my pleasure, thank you. Okay, um, let's just start. Uh, if you can tell us what is THAAD and what are its purported and actual capabilities? <laughs> Well, THAAD is uh, supposed to be a uh, missile defense system, a system designed specifically to shoot down uh, ballistic missiles that are uh, attacking certain areas. It consists of a uh, very powerful radar and, uh, and some 48 interceptors. And the, uh, so a full deployment of a THAAD battery would be 48 interceptors and, and this THAAD radar. The uh, important thing about the interceptors for the audience to be aware of is that they basically must hit their targets while the targets are basically in the near vacuum of space. And this results in an extremely uh, high level of vulnerability to countermeasures. Uh, the interceptor basically looks ahead to find the target it's going to hit and the target appears like a point of light. It's an infrared uh, homing sensor. So you can think of the target as just looking like uh, just a point of light. It, the, the interceptor cannot see any details of shape. And all an adversary needs to do is to intentionally break up the missile that launched the warhead. And the interceptor would see many points of light, and it would have no way of determining which point of light is the warhead. So it is extremely easy to defeat. Has the, um, have these interceptors been tested under that, uh, that circumstance where actually a number of objects are falling at it and it's had to make a decision about where to go? Has the military well, tested that? Uh, what we know is that there were supposed to be 11 successful tests. And we know that some part of them were against uh, ballistic missiles without the warheads being separated, and then uh, warheads by themselves. Uh, there is no statement about any uh, decoys being uh, accompanying uh, warheads, and no statements about even the conditions of the full ballistic missiles, the ones that have the warhead attached, um, when they are uh, are tested. So for example, uh, the ballistic missile could be tumbling side by side or end over end. In that situation, the THAAD interceptor would not be able to home on the front end of the ballistic missile because it does not have the homing capability against what appears to be an accelerating target. So um, now we know from past claims about successful testing, that they have been uh, false. For example, prior to the Gulf War of 1991, the uh, same company, Raytheon, that builds the FAD, uh, claimed that there were 17 tests against ballistic missiles uh, against Patriot interceptors, and they were successful 17 out of 17 times. In the Gulf War of 1991, following these tests, the uh, Patriots were successful zero out of 44 times. So the tests, uh, when they have been done, do not appear to be close to realistic. And of course, there's no information on the character of the tests except the claim, which is very likely to be false, that the tests were successful. 
Now, it is said that <clears throat> by Washington that the deployment of the THAAD system in South Korea is, uh, uh, the purpose is to intercept uh, missiles from North Korea. Uh, would, in fact, uh, these missiles be of any uh, use in deterring a, a missile attack from North Korea? Well, uh, I don't know if they would be able to deter a, a missile attack, but I don't think they would be able to uh, reduce the damage uh, from a missile attack. Uh, the uh, the kind of uh, we have not. I have. I was in South Korea uh, in October, and I had rather detailed discussions with people who were advisors inside the South Korean government uh, to the missile to the Ministry of Defense. And in no case could they, I, get, I was very direct, I asked them, what scenario uh, do you think a THAAD could be useful in? And the scenario that came up was one where 400 uh, what are called extended range SCUDs or SCUD Cs were fired at Pusan, the, uh, the big port in the uh, south of um, of South Korea, where uh, it is believed, where people expect supplies from Japan and elsewhere would come into South Korea if a war between the North and South occurred. And um, if you had 400 missiles fired at Busan, first of all, they would be so inaccurate that they would not be able to destroy significant port facilities. They would fall throughout the city. So there would be damage uh, if people took shelter, I think the loss of life could be held relatively low, although there would be significant general damage. It would certainly not close the port. Now, the question that I then asked was, if you have 400 missiles launched, how do 48 interceptors, assuming they work, <laughs> and that's a lot to assume, mm -hmm. change the outcome? Mm -hmm. and of course, they had no answer. So... Um, so I don't think that anybody that I, uh, people who, who would claim to have expert uh, knowledge inside uh, the uh, uh, South Korean government uh, have any scenario that makes sense to me. Now the THAAD unit is placed far enough south uh, in, in South Korea that it could not be used to defend uh, Seoul, for example. It's too far south, the interceptors could not get to intercept locations before attacking missiles arrived in Seoul. So that's not in range of FAD defensive interceptors. So it does not have a, the appearance of being able to do anything useful, if it worked. I see. Um, it, it is said or alleged by China, the PRC and Russia that uh, in actuality, this FAD system is uh, directed at them. Uh, does, in fact, THAAD pose a threat uh, to the uh, defense systems of uh, these two countries? And it's, uh... Well, the THAAD radar is designed from the beginning. I want to underscore the beginning of the design before anything was built required that it have direct connections, communication connections, to American early warning satellites and uh, to the... Uh, National Missile Defense Headquarters uh, for the American National Missile Defense System. So it can function as a primary sensor in, in among many sensors in the U.S. National Missile Defense System. Now, uh, the radar is sufficiently powerful that it could track Chinese ICBMs as they are on trajectories from China over the North Pole toward the United States. The radar would be looking northward. And if you look northward, these ICBMs would travel over Siberia. And so it could provide tracking information before the Chinese ICBMs rose over the radar horizon uh, from uh, that the American radars, the big American national missile defense radars would be, uh, would be looking at from uh, Alaska. So uh, this would provide what, what is sometimes called handover information to these radars. These radars would then be able to do much less 
searching of the horizon for possible arriving Chinese ICBMs, they would able, be able to concentrate on the locations on the radar horizon where the Chinese warheads would arrive. They could then have more time to search the, to, to check all of the objects they see so they can try to tell the difference between warheads and decoys, because the Chinese will certainly have decoys accompanying uh, the, uh, uh, their warheads. The, uh, the other thing that is theoretically, I want to underscore these are theoretical possibilities, uh, is that um, the United States could start launching some of its interceptors while the Chinese ICBMs are still below the radar horizon. And the interceptors could then be updated once the uh, warheads rise over the horizon and can get updated tracking information from the radars in Alaska. This would uh, increase the chances that the United States could try to intercept a warhead, assess whether or not the warhead was intercepted, and then fire a second uh, barrage of interceptors. It would give the extra time for the United States to do that. Having said this, none of these capabilities would really materially add to the near zero capability of the current national missile defense. So the real problem with the THAAD deployment is that it appears like the United States is trying to aim its missile defense at Chinese ICBMs. In reality, it will not truly add capability to the American national missile defense, but it looks like a breach of, uh, of, of the American word to China because the Americans have uh, told the Chinese that the, national missile, that the American national missile defense is not aimed in any way at China. It's aimed at North Korea. But now the Americans appear to be doing something that unambiguously looks like it is trying to increase its national missile defense capability against China. Now, I have had many years of uh, contacts with Chinese scientists. So the Chinese scientists I know understand what I just told you. Uh -huh. that is, they understand that the U.S. national missile defense has no capability against Chinese ICBMs and that, and that the introduction of the THAAD system has the appearance of trying to increase capability, but it will not materially change the situation. However, uh, what it appears like is a, is a breach of uh, the word of the United States to China. And the Chinese leadership, as the American leadership would be, is highly sensitive to actions that look like they are different from promises. Is and I do think that this is a real issue, very serious from, uh, in terms of its political dimensions, although I do not think it really undermines uh, China's ability to maintain its deterrent against the United States. But, uh, but I'm afraid the Chinese are taking this very seriously, just as I am sure American uh, political leadership would take a similar breach of word very seriously uh, from China or Russia. Um, going back to Korea, does the deployment of the THAAD system in South Korea in any way benefit South Korea? Well, I think um, uh, what it does is it will not materially provide any defensive capability to South Korea. That's a technical statement. I'm just saying this as a technical expert. And uh, politically, this is more of a statement now as an American ally of South Korea, who's concerned about uh, uh, what I would, what I as an American believe is a bad American policy, uh, it will uh, certainly increase tensions between the United States and China. It has already, and, with, and as expected, as expected by me at least, has greatly increased tensions between South Korea uh, and China. And I believe, I'm not an expert in South Korea, I want to be clear about that, but from what I have seen 
in South Korea, it, in my view, is understandably creating tensions between South Korea and the United States. Because if many South Koreans believe that the United States is not being forthright with the South Koreans, then uh, this raises problems for the alliance relationship. And uh, I'm very concerned as an American citizen. Again, I, I want to underscore I am uh, I'm not a South, I, I do not want to intervene in the South Korean internal political debate, but I do have an opinion as an American who is an expert on these questions that the American policy has not been forthright with South Korea. So the American policy has not only undermined trust with China, it has not been forthright with the South Koreans. For example, when my colleague George Lewis and I were first approached by the South Korean journalism community and asked about this problem, our initial reaction was it probably has no implications for South Korea. And then as we started studying it, we realized that it had this appearance. And um, then we also found out that South Koreans were, being, were asking about the capabilities of the radar and for reasons I cannot, you know, I just don't understand what's behind it. The South Korean people were not told the truth. For example, they were not told that this radar has a direct link to the American national missile defense system. They were simply either lied to or told, that, told something that wasn't true by people who did not know. And if they were telling the South Korean people this, I think they should have known this. So if they were, if they were South Korean government officials who are either ignorant or not telling the truth to the public, I can't say. But I do know that the South Korean public was not properly informed. And inc incidentally, the members of the National Assembly who I met with were not properly informed about the characteristics of this system. Um, <clears throat> given the rush to deploy that in South Korea and... Uh, the prospect of a, a more liberal president being elected in May, uh, Moon Jae-in. Uh, he has said that uh, he felt that the deployment of that needed to be revisited, um, the implication uh, possibly that uh, he might ask the United States uh, not to deploy that. Um, is it your sense in Washington or with the Trump administration that there is a possibility that the United States would align itself with the desires of a new administration, or is this going to cause more friction between uh, the United States and uh, South Korean uh, government? Um, I, don't, I don't understand the political situation well enough. What I can say is that this was an Obama administration idea. I want to be very clear. This was the Obama administration. It's now being carried forward I presume by people who are holdovers uh, from the Obama administration and the Trump administration, of course, is aware of this, so they may or may not uh, agree with this decision. They may not know enough yet uh, to have evaluated the situation from their point of view. But this, this was an Obama administration uh, activity. And the person who was uh, a big player from the American State Department was uh, Frank Rose, a person who uh, I know Frank over many years, and he made many statements uh, about the THAAD system that unfortunately I think are not true. So whatever was going on in the Obama administration, uh, there was a big push to deploy THAAD uh, into South Korea, and the administration was not being forthright in its public statements. I, I want to uh, end our uh, interview with uh, by going back to uh, <clears throat> the Obama administration's original uh, or stated purpose of deploying THAAD, which was to prevent uh, defend South Korea from a missile attack from North Korea. I wanted to ask you, what is what do you feel is the nature of North Korea's missile and nuclear weapons programs, and what would be the most reasonable uh, approach to addressing international concerns about those programs? Well, I think uh, the focus in the press 
on North Korea's ballistic missiles, <clears throat> excuse me, the focus in the press on North Korea's ballistic missiles is, is important, but I think somewhat overstated. Uh, the real problem is whether the North Koreans have a nuclear warhead that can truly be mounted on those ballistic missiles. So uh, we know that there are advances going on in the ballistic missile program. I just recently published an article with a German colleague of mine, Marcus Schiller, um, and uh, we know quite a bit about the program. Um, Marcus and I have looked at it quite a lot in detail. And although these missiles are a problem, they are really a problem because they can potentially carry a nuclear warhead. The, the danger from North Korean uh, ballistic missiles that have conventional warheads, that is to say high explosive warheads, is serious. But it is not nearly serious as seems to have become the folklore in the South Korean uh, electorate. If, um, if these missiles were used to attack Seoul and other big cities, there would certainly be extensive damage. And the loss of life would actually, could, say, could actually be kept quite low because these warheads are big enough to kill people if those people are unlucky enough to be out in the open and near them. But if these people take shelter, and there are plenty of big buildings that will not collapse, uh, then, then um, uh, they will not uh, cause large numbers of deaths and injuries. And although such an attack would be egregious, cause significant damage, it would certainly not be an existential threat to the survival or the capabilities of South Korea. I think this has been very much overstated. And the reason I make this point is not because I, uh, I'm insensitive to the fears and concerns of the South Korean people. My concern is that people not focus on a secondary problem when the primary problem is the possibility that North Korea could eventually have a nuclear weapon that could be delivered by these ballistic missiles. And it does not appear to me Nobody really knows at this time. It does not appear to me that the North Korean nuclear program has yet developed a nuclear warhead that could be carried on a ballistic missile. They claim they have, but the evidence they show is not convincing to me. What would be the most uh, reasonable approach? I'm sorry? What would be the most reason reasonable approach of uh, preventing that last step of occurring? If, if the... If there could be some form of diplomatic agreement that included an absolute end of nuclear weapons testing by the North, that would stop them from being able to develop this final step, which would be very serious. So I would say uh, it would also be very good to get an agreement to stop further developments of ballistic missiles. And I think that that would be an important thing to do. But the primary thing would be to stop the nuclear testing. I could speak at length about the ballistic missile threat. I've studied it in quite a lot of detail. But I think that would be doing a disservice to your audience. Your audience needs to focus on this serious, serious threat that one of the, that these nuclear warheads could eventually be weaponized. And it's possible one cannot rule out that that has not already occurred. But I think an informed guess suggests to me that this has not been the case. Okay. I want to thank you for joining us. Um, very much appreciate uh, your insights into the situation and hope to talk to you again. It is, it's my pleasure, and I wish to send my great sympathies to the South Korean people and the South Korean government. Thank you, Ted. Thank you.